Flavius Josephus is one of the most fascinating figures as we discovered as we were going through this. Being actually the inspiration for our original insight into this, our understanding of Flavius Josephus had to be one of our central uh, focuses. And one of the remarkable things about him is that outside of Christian literature, the New Testament itself, the earliest reference to Jesus himself, to Jesus Christ, is in the work of Josephus. It's quite remarkable that that's the case. Some decades before any pagan historians ever noticed Christianity, Josephus appears in two different places to be mentioning Jesus, which is remarkably early and makes him the first mentions of Jesus. The fact that he was the court historian of the Flavians is even more remarkable. He gives himself, in his own biography, quite a remarkable life story. He tells us that he was a student of all the different schools of Judaism. He came from both priestly and royal lines, according to his own description, and that he was a rebel leader himself, even though he was skeptical of the chances of the Jewish rebels in succeeding. When, in fact, the area he was in charge of was taken over by the Romans, we're told a remarkable story of how he went over to the Roman side, how he hid for three days in a cave, was discovered by a woman, and came out and was reborn to a new life, a new pro-Roman life, working for the Flavians, in effect a Flavian propagandist for them at this point. Josephus, he tells us in his autobiography everything about himself, and I think it's absolutely true. His biography called the Vita, it's worth reading. He even tells us his betrayal of the Jewish cause. He was originally part of the lower priesthood. He was sent up to Galilee to be a local commander of the revolutionary type forces, part of the revolutionary movement. But then the Romans came in. Well, he's just very much involved with the Pauline type of activity because he was taken to Rome as a captive and he surrendered and um, went over to the Roman side by you know, proclaiming uh, the Flavians as the new and future emperors of Rome which tended to uh, occur. And he presented himself as a prophet doing that. And therefore they took him to Rome with him, with them ultimately, because they were so pleased with this uh, a prophecy that this Jewish so-called prophet, who was a nobody, or just a traitor, had given. And uh, they changed his name to Flavius Josephus. They adopted him into the ro royal imperial family. And that from that moment on, he joined the contingent of, uh, really it was Titus, his Vespasian son, who was uh, moving through that area, uh, troops. And he even did a lot of translating for them, a lot of, a lot of intelligence work, a lot of that kind of thing. So he certainly had a lot to do with Paul in Rome when Paul was there. And um, yeah, I think they were involved, and some others, in, in, in developing this uh, new pro-Roman pacifistic messianism that was not going to cause a problem to the Roman authorities. Josephus is taken to be a Jewish historian of the end of the first century who uh, wrote histories uh, commissioned by our Flavians. In fact, uh, he gets this name Flavius Josephus from being adopted into the Flavian clan. And uh, so he's commissioned to write these histories of the War of the Jews and the Antiquities of the Jews. Josephus is famously the author of several books all of which, unlike a lot of ancient literature, were preserved by the Christians because the Christians regarded it as valuable literature. He wrote a comprehensive history of the Jewish war, nearly our only history of the Jewish war that survives from that period. He was, after all, an eyewitness to much of it by his own claim. Josephus is also credited with writing an autobiography. Josephus is most importantly credited with writing a comprehensive history of the Jewish people, one that parallels the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, with greater detail and continues it past the time up to Roman history, adding and supplementing and giving us, if you will, a comprehensive history of the Jewish people known as the Antiquities of the Jews. He also wrote A Defense of Jewish Culture Against an Anti-Semite, a book called Against Appion. Josephus's writings were handed down by Christians and they were preserved in that way and they are some of the only documentation that we have from that period. They reflect 
certain political alliances that would have been germane to the, uh, to the Christian effort. It was he who informed Vespasian that through his own prophetic visions, he understood Vespasian to be the upcoming emperor and the true messiah of Jewish prophecy. As we've indicated, scholars have long observed that Hebrew scriptures find many echoes in the Gospels, whether the slaughter of the innocents, the Sermon on the Mount, and so forth. So the very life of Josephus, as he describes it, parallels the Old Testament in just the same way. There is a Joseph, a very famous character from the book of Genesis, uh, who is sold into slavery and in interprets prophetic dreams for the Pharaoh, which leads to his ability to save the Hebrew people in the Old Testament. So it is we have Josephus interpreting prophetic dreams for a foreign emperor Vespasian, which helps him open up a pro-Roman form of Judaism that will, in effect, save his people. So the same sort of parallel parallelisms that we see from Hebrew scripture into the New Testament can be found in the biography of Josephus. Many works were ascribed to Josephus that echo Christian ideas, which show how widely Josephus was used by Christian scholars and how Josephus was used as an authority by Christian scholars. Until very recently, in fact, the podiums that were built in churches for the, to rest the Bible upon had a dual podium, and on one side was, were the works of Josephus, and on the other were the works of the Bible. That is how important the works of Josephus were seen by Christians as late as the 19th century. For many Christians, Josephus was an important authority, almost as important as the Bible itself for establishing the truth of their beliefs. A contemporary of Isaac Newton, who lived 300 years ago, is one of our early and certainly our most important translator of the works of Josephus. And he himself, this early and important translator of Josephus, believed Josephus himself to be a Christian. Astonishingly, he gives a description of himself which in many ways parallels that of the earlier figure, St. Paul. They both claim to be Pharisees who are normally Torah Orthodox, and yet both of them are paradoxically Torah critical. St. Paul very famously in the course of his letters uh, criticizes both circumcision, saying that although that was the very essence of the original covenant between God and the Jewish people, Paul argues this is no longer necessary in order to be a good Jew, a worshiper of the Jewish God. And Josephus makes the same argument. Precisely. Paul also makes the argument that it's no longer a sin to eat with Gentiles, presumably a critique of kosher diet. And obviously Josephus would eat with Gentiles for the rest of his life. In fact, they share the same politics. Just as Paul argues that the Roman government are God's appointed agents on earth, in effect, God has gone over to the Roman side. So Josephus argues that the Jewish God has gone over to the Roman side and so should good Jews, just as Paul had said, is on the Roman side like Paul and yet claims to still be a worshiper of the Jewish God. In so many ways, the ideology of Josephus positively reflects some of the moral doctrines we find in the New Testament. He praises John the Baptist. He praises James, the brother of Jesus. He praises their ideology, their love ideology, and their love commandments. So ideologically speaking, Josephus appears to be, in many ways, like a Christian. Indeed, he's messianic, a believer in messianic prophecies, only he calls his messiahs the Flavian emperors. But apart from that, in every other way, Josephus' ideas and approach appears to confirm Christianity, and in appears, in fact, to confirm the Christian understanding that the destruction of Jerusalem came as a punishment of the Jewish people for killing Jesus for that is exactly how early Christians viewed the matter. There are a number of other parallels, perhaps most curiously, that they both experience an odd and miraculous shipwreck at about the same time in history. Um, but they also share friends, perhaps in the figure of Epaphroditus.